there's our message. Okay, so um, again, thank you everyone. And I would just like to start off by giving a little bit of background information. Um, the Movable Collection is a program established by UAC to manage the City of Memphis collection of local art. Um, it is displayed on a rotating basis within community accessible spaces like our public libraries, our universities, park facilities, city hall, and the airport. Um, so we are just incredibly grateful to have so many talented artists in Memphis to be able to purchase works from 2D Works. Um, UAC is, of course, uh, always working to expand the definition of and the scope of public art so that we can um, do more to incorporate more artists, more mediums of art. And so this collection allows us to do that um, and engage with artists who um, may not have done a large scale mural before, may not have done a sculpture piece before and still want to be a part of the collection um, and get involved with UAC in a way. So that is a little bit of background about the movable collection itself. And these are our two featured pieces this evening. Um, the one on the left is from Maritza. It's called Be the Change You Want to See. And the one on the right is from Susan Mokstad um, called Number 34 Wanderlust. And so that brings us to our wonderful artist. Um, I'm going to have each of them, this is gonna be a conversation style um, and I'll have each of them talk a little bit about themselves and have their work up on screen for you guys to follow along. So um, if you need anything or would like to see a version of this PowerPoint after the presentation, feel free to email me and reach out as well for more information. So we're starting with our artist Maritza Davila. Maritza is a printmaker whose work emerges from the present, celebrates the past, and records for the future. So when we think about this, Maritza, um, what does that mean to you as an artist? What it means to me is that uh, I'm informed to what I'm coming, to what I came from, or my experiences. You know, the, the ones that that shape who am, am I, but also mindful that the present change constantly who I am and uh, by adding more experiences. And then that my work represents and recalls all those experiences also for the future. So that is, that, that is what it means to me. No, and so um, I think that for me, when I view your piece that is in the movable collection, Be the Change You Want to See, I can see that reflected in this piece. And even the title um, just speaks to, you know, having an impression of yourself, knowing what you would like to see reflected in the world, and then also having an understanding of your spatial reference to society, to what's happening around you and being able to reflect that. And so could you tell us a little bit more about this piece? Yes, this piece was a commission from the uh, Women's Foundation. And it's a portrait of, uh, of a colleague. My, it just escaped her name to me right this minute, but she, she died a few years back and she was the first in politics in Memphis in terms of being a woman and in terms to be an African-American. And so my response, Minerva Jonica, Minerva Jonica, that is her name. And so for me, I wanted to represent Minerva in her home, which for her was Memphis. So if you see the Memphis bridges at the bottom with, with lines converging the, the moving of the river with the people above it, because her call was to serve the people of Memphis. And so you also see references to her ancestry on the necklace she's wearing and to the little band 
above, just below the house that has African motifs. And so uh, I wanted to put my experience of Memphis in terms of what I chose to represent, but at the same time, uh, represent who she was in terms of her love for the city. And uh, the house shape is a shape that I had used constantly because I consider the house shape also, also called a home shape, or the, for me it's different the structure than the, the significance of the home. So in this case, the structure is a home because it's alluding her home, which is Memphis. I also use arches as a way of entrance, access of entrances to places. And in this case, I'm entering who she is as this person who has, who dedicated so much of her life to this city. Uh, the title is actually a saying from Gandhi. And she mentioned it to me, you know, that for her, she always remind herself of what Gandhi used to say, be the change you want to see. So then I decided to title the piece that way too. I really love that. I love the the ties to her culture too as well that are represented in this piece and the cowrie shells for me really draw me in because mm -hmm. that was an element that was used often in my family and mm -hmm. the cowrie shell symbolizes womanhood and fertility yeah. and I just think that you know if as you were saying that um, the arches invite us in they're homey they feel like an entrance to something and if she was giving back in this way, I feel like that all those elements together really help to convey that message that she was, you know, someone who was bringing light and change to Memphis. So thank you for sharing. You're welcome. And Susan, um, we are brought to you. And so um, you are an abstract artist whose subjects are weather, light, atmosphere, and space. And so you talk a lot about, um, you use metaphors of watercolor paintings and talk about the emotional impact of landscapes and panoramic views. And so would you like to speak a little bit more um, about yourself and your work, and then also tell us a bit more about your piece in the collection? Yes, hi, thanks everybody. Who who showed up today. Um, this is a piece of mine that's in the movable collection. I'm so happy that it is because it's a painting that I've always really liked and I was very happy that it has found a good home where people will get to see it. I'm not real great at naming paintings so I'll, I'll, I'm getting better <laughs> after all this time but I went sometimes I'll just like have a series and I'll just number them and in, because I see them all as kind of a you know, a body, a continuation of things and not as a separate unit from each other. So, so this one is just called number 34 Wanderlust. And um, I'll, I'll talk about this some more a little bit later, but um, I've, as I've been for many years now, for at least 20 years, maybe more, I've been painting about like trying to evoke an uplifting feeling in people. Um, working with the landscape, working with this expansive sense of space, and also uh, working with very mundane subject matter and trying to make it, um, to elevate it. So for instance, in the body of work I did before I did this one is, uh, was based on photographs I would take around Memphis. And um, there were things like, uh, par parking lots and um, streets and sidewalks and just uh, um, not very interesting things. But then I would like infuse them with light and space and take out the cars and take out all the man-made things and um, use them as the subject. And that's what that's what this one is is about. But this one is based on uh, traffic camera images, which I started working with. I don't remember, maybe 
12 years ago or something. And uh, obviously there are no cars in it. The, the, uh, the purpose of the webcam images or the traffic cam images was so that you would know if your, if your route had an accident on it or something. And I just found them very interesting as a little picture. So there would be, there would be the elements you would see in, in traditional landscape painting, like um, there might be a, a real stormy sky or the light might be reflecting off a particular piece of um, uh, architecture that was in the landscape. And it, I thought, these are really interesting as little pictures. So this particular painting um, was, of, was based on, you know, several images, but kind of based on the idea of a, of a, um, a clover leaf or an on-ramp onto a freeway as seen from an elevated position. And the, uh, I had all the elements that I really liked and the, the big sort of pink stripe I, uh, strip I sort of added at the end, it just made the piece. But if I show you the photograph it came from, you can kind of, that I was looking at, you can kind of figure it out because there was a, uh, you know, the, the steel or whatever it is that's a, a short fence that's alongside a ramp or something on the freeway. The barricade, was, hmm? the, bar the, the highway barricade. Right, except this was made out of metal and it was reflecting light and it was sunset, it was reflecting light. And so you really notice the, um, that movement in that particular little photograph. And um, so I think, you know, subconsciously I thought about that even though this, that pink was not the color <laughs> in the photograph, but that's being an art, an abstract artist, you know, I'm, I'm, it, that's okay. I'm not trying to represent exactly what I see. So that's what, you know, that's what this painting is. And I should say it's not real big. It's about like 16 by 22 or something like that. So the other, the last thing I want to say is I, I do make some bigger work, um, but most, I kind of, like somebody told me, you're known for your small paintings. And that's fine, because I like the idea that you could take this, this enormous expansive space and focus it and concentrate it into a smaller uh, area. And so, so that it's not doing what that landscape would do if you were in it, which would be a kind of engulf you, but now you're focused in on this area. And that's something I really enjoy doing. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think we, our next question talks about the fact that I guess, well, both of you guys are not originally from Memphis. And so <laughs> I just wanted to talk a little bit about your roots of origin and your connection to Memphis, which, um, I think both we've touched on a little bit, the Maritza, you, um, are from New York. And so I don't know, <laughs> uh, you know, what that, what that means to you, but I'm hoping that you've got some good Memphis uh, appreciation also in your heart. I know that New Yorkers, that's their, you know, their ride or die. They love that city so much. <laughs> well, actually I'm not from New York. I was okay. been living, I lived in New York for seven years and only because I went to do my MFA at Pratt. Mm. So that's my connection to New York. I okay. grew up in Puerto Rico. I did not, I did not arrive in New York until 1985. Uh, 1984, I did a summer at the Pratt Graphic Center. And then I came back in 1985 to start my degree at Pratt Institute. So, th so that is my connection with New York. My connection to Memphis is in a way my husband, you know, her family was at this time living in Memphis. They are not from Memphis. They're from Oklahoma and Kentucky. And my husband was born in Italy because his father was in the army as a chaplain. So he lived in all over the United States, but then his father moved to Memphis because this, this is the, the uh, how can I say that? He's a Cumberland Presbyterian and Cumberland Presbyterians has a big uh, representation here in Memphis. So that's how we arrived in Memphis. New York did not have enough for us to keep us. We are both family oriented mm. and we did not have but our son. And we frankly, 
felt like we have done enough of what we actually wanted to do in, in New York. And so we came to Memphis thinking that we were going then to Seattle, but then we ended up staying in Memphis. I got connected to the Memphis College of Art. It was a great experience I started teaching there in 1982, uh, part-time and eventually became full-time. And then my husband uh, was working for the Commercial Appeal and uh, he, uh, so he had a career there in journalism. And so we stay and form a family and form connections and discover that Memphis is a wonderful, easy place to live that was allowing us to do what we wanted it to do. And in the matter and form that I wanted it to do it in terms of myself. Mm -hmm. And so my daughter was born in here and I feel like Memphis is my second home besides being in Puerto Rico, which is where I was born. Mm -hmm. So my roots to Memphis right now, they run very deep because my family has developed here and I have developed my career in here. There's many things that this place has allowed me to do and to become. Well, we love to hear that. Um, I have some pieces also that, um, will show after this question, but Susan, if you would like to share a little bit about your connection to Memphis and tell us about your roots of origin. Oh, sure. Yes, thanks. Um, well, I've lived here since 1997 and I had to do the math today. That's 24 years, almost exactly. And I moved here to accept a full-time teaching position at Memphis College of Art. So that's why I ended up here. Now I have I had visited a few years prior to that. And I remember thinking, wow, oh, Memphis is a, a really interesting, cool place to visit. I don't know if I'd want to live there. <laughs> and then a few years later, I got the job. And, and so, um, so here I am and I, you know, I have no regrets. I, I um, consider myself a Midwesterner and I have lived in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa and Illinois. Illinois several times, like I kept kind of going back to Illinois. I've also lived in three Western states. Um, and really it wasn't until we had started this meeting that I realized that, you know, the Western states are dramatically beautiful. You know, the, the landscapes like with, with the mountains and the snows on the mountains and um, uh, Mount Rainier with, you know, it's a volcanic mountain. I mean, yeah. All the different, and I've lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico, all these different landscapes, they're dramatically beautiful. And yet, and I love them, but I really, really love my Midwestern landscape where there's not much going on. It's, it's a humble kind of beauty. And, you know, I had uh, just today, you know, it's really sunk in since we started this meeting. Um, I guess, um, I guess I would just say, you know, it's funny to, to think, you know, I, I consider myself a Midwesterner, meaning like Illinois and Iowa and so forth. And now I'm a Mid-Southerner. So, you know, it's like, I'm going to be a Mid-something, you know, but I think that, you know, the Mississippi River is the, like the, the, um, the, the spine, you know, that, that mm -hmm. all those states are on. And, and my sister and my brother both live in, in uh, states along the Mississippi River. So, so there's this, this really beautiful kind of geographic connection between us all. Oh, I know. I think um, I just actually recently did a trip back to Nebraska with my mom and, and drove and saw a lot of those mundane scenes, but they really are beautiful and special in their own light. I've done mm -hmm. I've done the cross country to see the mountains and all of those landscapes, but I think that the way that your work highlights um, traffic cam videos and things in a way that are so engaging and just so eye catching and pleasing to see. I, I think that's very interesting to hear that you've seen a little bit of all these landscapes and that's what you've chosen to bring out the beauty in. And so I, I really appreciate that. Thank you for sharing. Um, the next piece that we have are two of pieces from Maritza, who 
Um, these are some of her earlier works. And um, if you'd like to speak to them a little bit and tell mm -hmm. us about um, how these are culturally influenced from um, the places that you've lived and the things mm -hmm. that you've experienced so far. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the first piece, which is uh, the one above it to Joe, uh, is a lithograph reduction woodcut. It's uh, pretty large for what uh, is, it was actually the first piece that I did that, that I was exploring uh, the size and, and what the, the space uh, can do for, for the image, especially when you are a printmaker. And uh, it was produced during a residency at Asset Studios in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. And uh, in the 2011, which was the year that I took my sabbatical and uh, from the Memphis College of Art. And it actually, there's three faces of my daughter. My daughter became my muse very early on. And uh, what I was looking for is her youth, her, uh, her adventurousness, and at the same time, how, how quickly emotions changes when, when you are that young. Also, I incorporated for the first time the use of text. Uh, text for me and work and, and visual work is, is a strange combination. I always very eerie and suspicious when people use this text as part of the visual because it's usually, on my estimation, is not used properly. They, you either read something or you see something. So what I decided to use in the text, it was as a form of texture and as something aerial, as a dialogue that has movement. And in this case, the dialogue was in Spanish. Uh, the reason I was in Spanish is because even though I speak Spanish, my daughter do not. And it's something that I miss so much because she used to, when she was a child, uh, to understand and to speak English. And then as she grew up, maybe because of the situation surrounding her, I found myself in the losing side in terms of the language. So it does have language around her, but it's language that is related to her. And then the one in the little houses in between, which is actually homes, the homes for language, the homes for understanding, the homes for fleeting dialogue. And uh, so on the very top, it says to each job, which is me, me and her. Uh, so, and, and it got, and it, and it moved from the, the not being aware, just enjoying, to actually realizing something is happening to then fully realizing something it is happening. <laughs> so it, it moved from the oblivious to the reaction. And the reaction is, and as the reaction goes, you notice that the color at the bottom grows, the red grows more, uh, raises more. And uh, and so uh, to kind of add a component to the emotional part of the getting to react or getting to be aware of something. And that something can be about her or can be about language. And, uh, and I do also uh, want the people, you know, also to connect to to what is happening, the jumble that is happening, the noise that is happening in sometimes conversations that are not connected and then sometimes connected. Connection, disconnection, that's something we can have through language. The one at the bottom is a, is a later one. And uh, I use myself because I didn't have any other models. <laughs> but, uh, but then it became a challenge for me in terms of how do I want to present this person who happened to be me? 
So that's why I decided to go naked, you know, to present myself. This is who I am. And then surrounded by what? Surrounded by who I am, to my identity. So it has, uh, it has a lot more text than the other pieces that I started with in the beginning. But the use of text is being done in such a way with transparencies that you do not notice in this slide, but as you move, you can see more or less of what is going on in the black surrounding the figure. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a piece that talks about discovery, that talks about exposing and exposing in terms of uh, honesty at that moment and uh, who I am within my, my interracial self and uh, with my Spanish, African and indigenous roots. So it's, it's, uh, it, it was for me a, a, a challenging piece that from which I learned uh, quite a bit, you know, and also it's a very large piece. You know, it's, it's, it's actually about the size of the first one, maybe a bit taller. Mm. So I started working on larger pieces. And what I do is that I do collage to make them larger, you know? And uh, so it's the multiple pieces within the same piece. It's so interesting that you started off by saying that you don't really use text much in your work. And these both pieces have the text, like you said, displayed in a way that's very yeah. subtle and it doesn't scream at you, but it's there and yeah. it, it very it's, much relates to what you're saying. I I can also relate to because um, I come from a, a Dominican background, Dominican and African American yeah. background, and I also don't speak Spanish. And so just seeing the, the facial features change in your daughter and the, you know, the constant... Um, going back and forth, transitioning into two different spaces, really, between the Spanish and the English language and how you're communicating, what you're able to process, and then seeing that in your Ola piece as well of, you know, this coming to form true image of yourself, you know, this really introspective piece. I think it's, it's interesting when we do self-portraits and really have to confront us as this human being, you know? Yeah, I, I had to challenge myself to do it. It was not easy, but then <laughs> I said, okay, I, I have to do it. I'm not gonna use anyone else, may as well use me. And I just directed my husband in the, in the manner I wanted it to, to show myself, you know? So, so in, in that case, and, and as you say about the text is, uh, text is very tricky in terms of visual art. It can work for you, it can work for the piece or work against the piece. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the challenge was how do I do text and make it visual without making people think that they actually have to read it. They can enjoy the many aspects of it as textual and read it or not read it. Mm -hmm that they're not limited to just the message within those words. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And so next we have pieces from Susan, previous pieces that I would love to hear more about. Um, these are two landscape uh, pieces. Golden is on our left and clearing is on our right. And so if you'd like to speak more about uh, these pieces and the influences behind them. These are pretty recent. I mean, in the last two or three years, uh, the one on the left has that, you know, that that kind of uh, arcing shape of several of them in it. And it actually is very loosely based on a traffic camera image of um, uh, on ramps and going an on ramp going underneath a bridge. And the light is all made up. Um, 
I'm very influenced by 19th century American and French landscape painting, but also Turner. I, I realized, oh wait, not just French and American, <laughs> but I, I think, you know, look, if you look a lot of uh, Turner's paintings, the British painter, um, he, they're a lot about light. And some of them are kind of indecipherable, but you know you're looking at a landscape. And so um, I wasn't consciously thinking about him, but now as I'm looking at this painting today, um, I'm, I'm thinking, gosh, you know, I feel like I was just channeling him. And then on the right, the painting, that's actually based on a painting by um, another British landscape painter, John Constable. Um, I was kind of like, I didn't, I was having trouble, like, what do I want to paint? What do I want to paint? And so uh, usually I will, um, I don't draw in the sense of sitting down and sketching, but I do watercolor. And to me, that's a form of drawing. And it's because I'm thinking about color at the same time I'm thinking about everything else. So I'm not going from, from a, like a charcoal drawing or a black, you know, a pencil drawing to then thinking, oh, maybe I could use this for a painting. Oh, what colors do I want to use? So I, years ago, I figured out if I use watercolor, then I'm, I'm always thinking about the color at the same time. So anyway, I, had, I have a couple of John Constable books, you know, with reproductions, and I found this one, I just couldn't get over this one painting. It looks nothing like this painting on the right, <laughs> nothing. It has trees in it, water, and, you know, but it was a jumping off point. I've done a number of paintings based on this and a bunch of watercolors, and it was just, it was inspirational. Now, it looks like it's related to the one on the left, you know, because of the way the lines move through the landscape, and um, I, the painting clearing on the right, I wasn't thinking about, I'm gonna put highways in here. It, that wasn't it, it was just, but I think it's a carryover from things I have been thinking about. Um, because I can't remember if I said this previously when we were looking at the painting that had the big pink um, strip through it, that uh, one of my themes is, you know, the broad theme is nature and culture. Um, to me, and nature is kind of self-explanatory, but by culture, I mean, things that, that humans have done to the landscape. And, um, and so reconcile, reconciling those two things and trying to, to make them work together in some way is, is something that um, I'm, you know, I think about a lot. So um, in your, in your uh, the, the picture, you had the picture of me with like, you know, with a definition of myself or something, you know, you said like light, atmosphere, color. Um, and then, as I've said before, this, this wanting to give this expansiveness and this sort of feeling of being uplifted. Years ago, I read a book on happiness. And one of the things that I don't remember anything about that book, except one thing that really stuck with me is that People who are unhappy or depressed, they're very sort of closed in and like sort of claustrophobic and people that are happy feel expansive. And so that word really sticks in my mind and I try to make these, these paintings that have this expansiveness in it. Um, they, so uh, I think that's all I, I wanna say about those two things right now. Thank you. I, um, I remember also reading, um, from an excerpt that's on our website about your reading the Buddhist practice of groundlessness is mm -hmm. something that you try to um, evoke in your work. And so I think that's really interesting. I had never heard of that concept before. And so I thought that that was um, something to really, to again, to be aware of your space and the fact that you you know, you do take up it, you take up space and in, in, in the world, but we also relatively are small beings. And so we should, you know, not get lost in, find that balance between not getting lost in the expansiveness of the world and also not getting lost in the fact that we are also expansive as well and that we're so capable of so many things. So I, I really enjoy that. Thanks. Um, so we have a question that I think we've kind of touched on a little bit. And so um, I will go a little ahead to um, the pieces that come after this. And we talked about what has kind of inspired you all to become an artist and your pathway to, um, to public art is what we kind of want to touch on. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. And Maritza, if you wanted to give 
any information about this piece from 2020, one of your more recent works? Yeah, yeah. This piece was made before and during pandemia. I mean, it's a, I was working towards my exhibition at the Dixon. And so I already had this one that I started doing on April of the year before. But for me, there was something missing to this piece, even though that it seems to have a lot, it, it, it needing a companion. And then while I was working for some new pieces, the other two pieces happened. And uh, as you can see, I have a lot of text, which is very textural and, uh, and hidden messages related to our feelings of hopelessness, of hope, uh, call for unity and family. And the title is We Are One. And so in, in, this, in, in this one, my inspiration was the isolation, but then the kind of unity that we, are, that we really consciously try to maintain in isolation. So being with my husband day in, day out, it, it was amazing. You know, I mean, maybe some other people have trouble with that, but uh, we met for lunch, we met for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and in between we walk, we, we work. You know, he worked in his office because he continued doing work, and I gone to my studio because I had that exhibition. And so working on the pieces on the side, I realized these are the two pieces that the pieces in the middle need. You know, and uh, so the idea that we were not together, but at the same time we were together in spirit, you know, like my family, we video a lot. So this is why the transparency of the panels on the right and the left, you know, like, uh, and the one that it seems to be very present, which is that lonely hand stretching mm -hmm. to, to the to the infinite you know like i'm trying to touch something or i try to go somewhere you know and uh so so the companion pieces is the people who are with us no matter what and the hope that we will meet again we will hug again we will visit with each other again so this, this is starting, this was during uh, uh, March, April. So it was like a one year later that I started working on these other two pieces, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so as you can see the, the adults and children, you know, the, the, the families, it, it's, it was sad, but at the same time was hopeful. It was a struggle, but at the same time, we all hopefully grew up within the challenge, or at least I feel like did. And uh, so the text in here is more, more condensed. You really have to work into it to see it. So hopefully it's a piece that you come back and see something else and something else and something else and something you really else. get to analyze yeah 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 so so it, it represents a time it works with my language and the long and, and the english language and all that the language and uh, and hopefully it will be a record for a time in which you know Communication shifted. Yeah, it, it will be a record of this time, and and uh, and I'm pretty sure there will be situations in which we're gonna find each other in the same situation again, and then. So it was an it was a period for me of assessing. What is it that I was going into my work? Thank you. 
I think it's interesting too that you started off with one piece and then you yeah. made two companion pieces for this piece about um, being together and, and getting back together. So I really, I think that's so telling of, of that work can take us on a journey that we don't even know it's, you know, forming itself, it's creating its own life as we're creating the piece. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, Susan, we have a piece from you titled Spring Break um, that you um, created. I, I don't remember the year on this piece, but if you wanted to tell us a little bit more, I know that we are coming towards the end of our talk. And so I want to make sure that we touch on our last question as well, um, that will kind of you know, bring us to our close and our ex and a little bit of exciting images to see at the end of this presentation as well. Um, so I don't know if this is a more pertinent piece or that you would like to speak to um, the next piece in our slideshow as well or combine them. Let me see which one it was, I forgot. Yeah. Um, no, just, uh, I just, I don't have much to say about this painting at all because all the themes I've already talked about, you can see here in this painting. The only thing I wanted to say is um, you had asked uh, what inspired me to us to become artists. And um, just very briefly, I mean, I was one of those kids who liked to, you know, was artistic, but I also uh, was musical. I loved to write. And then as I got a little older, I loved all my classes in school. And when I got to college, I liked all my classes. And then I took an art class and a, uh, which, you know, it was like, whoa, I, you know, I forgot how much I love art. And uh, one of my teachers, a painting teacher said, I can't remember the exact words, but he said something like, um, uh, all of your, all of your interests, all of your experience can feed into your artwork. So the art could be this sort of umbrella for everything instead of just this very limited focus. And that just, that was a pivotal moment for me. And it made me, and, and, and it, it's like, yeah, that was it. I think, I think you get it. I don't think I need yeah. to explain it any further, but um, so that was when I realized sort of like, oh, I want to be an artist, you know, and I don't, you know, so it seems like a, a good choice. So uh, that's all I really want to say right now. Thank you for sharing that. I think um, in our previous talk, uh, Larry Walker also shared a story about um, his pivotal moment with understanding when he could finally label himself an artist. And I think that that's so interesting to hear that so many artists, myself included, have a hard time calling themselves an artist in the beginning when they're first starting out. And figuring out how they want to represent themselves. Or I think that honestly, to, to me, being an artist is a lifestyle. It's, it's within everything that we do from, you know, home decor renovations in the pandemic of picking out what colors go with, with thing and going out on a picnic day, for example, and you, Susan, being inspired by the horizon line or the clouds that we're watching or Maritza, you seeing, um, a mother interact with her daughter in a, in a shopping area and, and speaking in two different languages or something. I think art is inspirational and is within everything that we do. So I think that your, your teacher describing being an artist as an umbrella to all of the facets that make us up as a human being are, that's just a phenomenal way to describe it. So thank you so much for sharing that. I think we, we've talked a lot about the themes and the elements and the influences that are seen in your work. Um, I wanna briefly show these images, Maritza. These are the images that um, you said have influenced some of the artists that have influenced some of your work. And um, I want to, I want to, to stay and pause for a second, but um, I wanna make sure that we cover this other one. So maybe we'll come back to these influence images. Um, these are some images that Susan uses when she's creating some of the traffic cam images that she was referring to earlier when we talked about the themes. Um, and so, yeah, of course you can see now um, mm -hmm. that horizon line and some of those bends and turns and things that um, she's so famous for including in her work. And so I just, I really am 
always so astounded by the fact that this everyday thing, something that I think all of us have seen, you know, on the when we used to watch the news in the mornings and they'd show us the what's it, WMC TV five live hover view of, of the of the day and you see the traffic cameras and they're reporting about the accidents and things all the way to these beautiful pieces that you've created that I, you know, I think at first glance, I wouldn't have seen that or thought that th that, that was your inspiration. And so I'm, I'm always just, uh, I always think that that's so cool. Um, but our, our big question, the question that I really wanted to ask you guys tonight, um, what is your why behind wanting your work shared in community centered public spaces? And I think um, this question is even more pertinent because both of you are included in our movable collection, but you are also both included in the renovations that are happening at the Memphis International Airport right now. And so um, I just wanted to, to talk about that, to show the pieces that you have. Um, Maritza, this piece is going into the collection at the Memphis Airport. And Susan, I'll flash really quickly, um, has a design that is going in as a art glass. It's being installed in the restroom area of the airport. And so um, both of you, either one, whoever, um, what does it mean for you to have your work um, in these community-centered public spaces and at such a large scale? Well, for me, um... I, I uh, at some point in, at some point in my high school or college, you know, education, um, it was in, it was instilled in my head that art is a, a mode of communication. It's a visual communication. You know, of course, an art visual art has its own language, and um, so you know that to me, the work isn't really completed until. It, it's out in the world somehow. So that, so there's an interaction with people looking at the work. And so, um, so that, you know, putting it out in the world is, is important and putting it out in um, uh, community centered public spaces. Uh, I think that's important too, because, you know, when you're an artist and your friends are all artists and you know, you know, and you then you know the art world that like in Memphis you, and you go to art openings, um, you're seeing all your same people, which is great. I love it. Don't get me wrong, but it's it's really nice to have artwork out in in the libraries, in the airport, in other public spaces, and so that so that um, people can interact with the work and however that is. Maybe they don't like it, but but maybe you know they have they have some kind of feeling about it. Um, they may hopefully they look at it, and and to me that's really important that art art reaches a broader audience than just other people involved in art. So that's, that would be my, my uh, answer to that question. Thank you. I definitely, I, as a UAC person and staff member, I definitely can get behind that, that uh, feeling. And Maritza, I'll go back to your image. Um, let's hear what you have to say about how you feel being in such a large area, the airport, such high traffic area. I think that Susan has said exactly or very close to my sentiments is art is to be shared. Art is part of life. Expression is a necessity on all of us. Um, it speaks to the quality of life speak to the necessity we all have into seeing and saying things in different ways. It speak to the individuality and commonalities. Commonality in all of us, you know? And uh, that's what I can add to what Susan says so eloquently. You know, because that is the way I feel about art. Art is made to be shared. You know, it's, it's, and, and I remember as a child sharing what I did. I, I started doing art 
in elementary school. It was, it was this need. And my father was a musician and he tried to make me a musician too, but he soon realized that visual arts was my niche. And I found supported by him. I always have art materials around me. And I was lucky enough to went to a fine arts high school. I asked my father to enroll me there. And so my experience as an artist started very early on in terms of having drawing, design, painting. I did not get to do printmaking until I went to college. And that was a complete discovery, you know. I was given to become a painter. And I think that's, that's my second part of me is being a painter. Mm -hmm. in, but in this particular piece, I like the idea of the multiples. I like the idea that I can exhibit this piece in the airport, but I still have another piece, it, it, two or three of pieces like it in my house. And they, each one of it is an original. It's not a copy because they're meant to be a print. So this particular print, I have chosen all the elements of my ancestry and composed it into this family. It's actually called ancestral chapel. So you have the African elements, you have the Taino elements, and it's the very first time in which I use letters in a very basic way, like the Enye, which is particularly to the Spanish language, as you know. But it has Taino elements, and then it has the mask at the bottom. And they and the, so it speaks to the mythology, where we have been and where we are. You know, so you had the children, the parents. Uh, so I, I used the hands of my husband, my daughter, children of, of friends of mine to compose this multicolored family, you know, that uh, reaching for who they are or for who they want to become. So in, in that sense, you know, it has the sky, which is also can be water, you know, the shell, which is a symbol related to water in many cultures, in African cultures, in indigenous cultures, you know, the, so mythology based on indigenous parts, you know, like, like the twins in, in one side and the Atabeira, which is the goddess of fertility or the goddess of everything created on the other side. And, and so I wanna share with, with the public where I come from and hope that they identify also as part of them because mm -hmm. we all are have multiple experiences but based on the similarities of being human mm -hmm. and so apart from our humanity you know it, they are i i believe there's a little piece for everybody to connect to i think that's so true and and i think that an airport is one of the most diverse places on the planet, honestly. And so I being able to, to share so much ancestry within that space is amazing. And I, I thank you both so much for everything that you've shared with us this evening. Um, it looks like we are unfortunately past 630. And so I, I wanna open it up to questions if anyone has any but also feel free to reach out and send questions to me and I can get them to our lovely artists this evening. If you had anything that you'd like to share or a, just a comment of praise or adoration, because I know I have so much for both of you. And um, I want to also share these little sneak peek images of um, the art glass that has recently um, been transported and installed. These are from our wonderful project manager, Wendy, who um, supplied these great images of the glass being transported. And so these are very 
top secret images. I can't share more, unfortunately, right now. Um, I did not sign an NDA with the airport, but something similar. So I definitely um, would just love, love, love for you guys to get excited about this piece and all of the pieces that will be featured at the airport and all of the pieces that are featured in our public libraries for you guys to visit and see um, as they're opening back up. Um, I know some libraries were closed uh, due to COVID. And so as that's happening, please get out there and feel free to be your own photographer, take images of these pieces and let us know how they make you feel. Please feel free to tag us, tag the artists and let's get more conversations going. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I am going to be back again next Thursday with the lovely Catherine Elizabeth Patton and um, the also lovely Lawrence Matthews. So I hope to see everyone here again next Thursday. And thank you to Susan and Maritza so much. I thank enjoyed you. having this conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. Good evening. Bye.